Welcome. In this video, I'll show you how I set up my JavaScript development environment on Linux, primarily for full stack JavaScript development. Let's start with distributions. Most beginners or people who want to start using Linux are very interested in the distribution to use, what distro they should start using for development. It really does not matter. More than 90% of the distributions are derived from either Debian, Red Hat Enterprise Linux or Fedora, and the Arch Linux family of distributions. All of these distros and their derivatives are completely capable to set up a development environment for JavaScript, full stack JavaScript, or frankly, any other programming language workflow you can think of. What will be easiest for you if you're a beginner, if never used Linux or used Linux very briefly, I would recommend something like Fedora. You get a very rich repository of packages from the Fedora repository of RPMs and you get Wattpack pre-configured. I would also recommend some of the Debian-based distros or in fact, Debian itself for beginners as well. So this is the starting environment, a very clean install of Fedora Linux. Before you start, update your Linux distro to the latest packages, latest security updates. Make sure you have Git, it's pre-installed on Fedora. On some distros like Debian, for example, you have to install Git, which is not a problem. Just use the native package manager. Git is available in every Linux distribution as a package. As I mentioned, the distro is not that important. Packages, however, package formats, are kind of important. Now, traditionally, this is for beginners to introduce you, um, back in the day when there were no package managers, you had to compile everything on Linux from source. That was way back, keep in mind. Uh, so you download the source code for the app, that's usually C++ code, and compile it with make, install it with make install, basically, which just moves it to a certain directory. You needed to do a lot of setup around that, meaning, not really that complicated of a setup, but wait for compilation and then move the necessary files, create, uh, do some scripting for config files, create config files in certain directories if uh, there are no installation scripts in, with the build. And you need to integrate that in the desktop environment. So create basically uh, a desktop file and GNOME or whatever to be able to start a graphical user interface app or add it to your path if you want to use it in the command line. Thankfully, you don't need to do that anymore. We get packages, package formats, which is essentially either called to be compiled or binaries, pre-compiled binaries for the distro, and some scripting and metadata, which tells the distribution how to install the app. Installation meaning either completion or moving binaries to a directory and adding files for the desktop environments to recognize what kind of an application that is, or adding it to the path for command line utilities. And these packages are .deb Debian packages for Debian-based distributions, which is the most popular package format. Fedora uses RPM, which is a different package format for the basic user. You can look at these two as exactly the same thing. Package of files, an archive, which installs with a script. And that means just moving files and creating some configs. And of course, Arch-based distros have uh, Pacman and Pacman packages, and they have a package build and scripts, and they function the same way as Debian packages or RPMs do. There are other package formats for Linux that work differently. These are predominantly Fatpak, Snap, or AppImages. These are universal package formats in that they run in a sandboxed environment above your distribution, and they include all of the needed dependencies inside and they run sort of sandboxed without messing too much with your system. They, they try not to interfere with the base system. They have everything they need to run in their own environment, which has some downsides and some upsides. The good thing is in terms of security, they're great. They don't really touch much unless you give them permission for specific capabilities like file system access, for example. They use a little bit more file system storage because they have all of their dependencies. On the other hand, um, they are updated Frequently, they have latest versions. They are very stable because they have the right dependencies packaged with them. So really, I would say you can use both for um, both native packages, RPMs and Debian packages and flat packs, depending on what is available and on the specific application and the access it needs to or doesn't need to have to your system. So let's start with the first environment, which is web browsers. On Fedora, as well as most other distributions, you have Firefox pre-installed. It's also available as a DNF package. That's what you get with the distro out of the box. 
We can also install a Flatpak version of Firefox. It's available on FlatHub and the Fedora Flatpak uh, repository. I will use the pre-installed Firefox and not deal with any other version of Firefox to install, but we need Chrome. I want to install Chrome and Chrome Dev through Flatpak. So I will first install Chrome stable and I will also install Chrome Dev. Chrome Dev is useful if you want to test newer features. I will also search for Chromium. I will use that as my main browser. Now, for a main browser, I would actually usually not install a Flatpak. Chromium is available in uh, the Fedora repositories. It's also available in Debian and all other distros. When it comes to Node.js, things are simpler in that there's only one implementation, not like with web browsers. You need multiple Node versions. So I don't install Node.js from the native repositories. I install Node version manager, NVM, and manage multiple node versions on my system with that utility. It works great. Let me show you how. Now, NVM, the node version manager, we can install by going to the GitHub page. Just Google that, use the search engine, and the NVM repository has an installing and updating section. Just copy the curl or wget script, depending on what uh, downloading package you have. Curl is usually pre-installed on most distros. If it's not, just use apt, dnf, or whatever to install curl, and just run the script. It installs NVM and it will give you a message that you need to either restart the terminal emulator to have it available or add it to the path with a simple command. OS Remote lists the available versions online. I will install the latest LTS version first and I will install the most current version of Node, which is 23.1. We have both available. Now I have uh, Node 23.1, the latest version, which I installed latest currently. If I run NVM LS, I see the available versions. I can say Node NVM use 20.18, which is the current LTS. And if I run Node V now, I see that version. And you can switch Node versions like this. It's very simple and very forgiving in terms of syntax. As you can see, I can just type NVM use 23 and it automatically switches. Code editors and IDs, a topic that's as controversial as distros, maybe. So for JavaScript, most code editors and IDs used are available on Linux, thankfully. Visual Studio Code is the big name here, dominates the market share, and rightfully so. You have the most amount of extensions, the best large language model, model support, the probably best code completion and IntelliSense features you will find in a JavaScript code editor. So for anyone that's starting, doesn't know which editor to use, start with Visual Studio Code. Performance is good. Uh, extensions are the best extensions ecosystem in the world and um, settings are pretty flexible. So you can probably make it work for you. Now, that being said, you can also use Vim, NeoVim if you want. They are of course available on Linux. V is installed by default. Most people use NeoVim. You can set that up if you want to do, do keyboard heavy navigation, productivity with the keyboard macros, etc. That's for advanced users. If you want to use those, you probably already know your way around Linux. You know how to set that up. It's straightforward. These editors are very old and available in the package repositories of all distros. Now, an alternative to VS Code with a special alternative I've covered on my channel, and you can see the video, is Z. It's interesting in that it's built sort of like a video game as opposed to the Electron app that VS Code is. You get a, a good performance with Z. There are some hardware requirements. You need a Vulkan GPU. The performance is great. Uh, extensions are very bad. They, they have extensions since, I mean, a few months, I believe. There are only a couple of hundreds. Language support is not that good, not even close to VS Code. And large language model integration is good though, because they have it built into the editor for most uh, modern providers. And um, it's just a good alternative if you're really performance cautious, but um, nowadays really the standard for web and JavaScript development is VS Code. Uh, you can install that on Debian and, uh, uh, Debian and Fedora based distros easily. Uh, for Debian, you have packages and repositories on the site. There's also Flatpak available, and there are some spins like VS Codium, which is uh, Visual Studio Code without the Microsoft telemetry and Microsoft related integration, which is uh, an option if that's the route you want to take. There are hundreds of spins of VS Code, both in the browser for your system, which you can install. But I'll show you how to install the Microsoft's version of Visual Studio Code 
through Flatpak because it's a good option and it's easy and you can update it easily and you'll have the latest version always. Just uh, search for VS Code um, and Flatpak install uh, the Visual Studio Code package. When you start the Visual Studio Code app, you will see a Flatpak warning text file that will open, which will outline all of the uh, weird things related to the fact that you're using a Flatpak version of VS Code. And one of them is that you have to copy and paste um, this config for the terminal emulator into your settings JSON file. So nowadays, if you deploy an app, especially if you build a Node.js application, you need to deploy it on containers. You need a Docker environment, most likely. Thankfully, that's relatively easy to set up on Linux and it runs great. Um, we have two parts uh, that I'll show you how to install. The Docker engine and command line utilities and Docker desktop. I'll show you how to install the Docker desktop graphical user interface app, which is helpful if you, it, it's not necessary. You can use the command line with Docker, uh, but uh, the desktop application is, is helpful for beginners to manage volumes, containers, and clusters you have. Uh, so I'll show you how to install both. Let's jump into that. To install Docker, just uh, Google Docker Linux and you'll get an article to install Docker desktop on Linux. Here we have two things we need to set up. The Docker engine, uh, which includes uh, the Docker engine utilities, command line utilities, and we need to install that first. Uh, but let's get to the Fedora section. If we get to the Fedora section on Docker desktop, it will guide you through the entire process to install first the Docker engine and the desktop. First, we need to handle dependencies. You need GNOME terminal if you're not using GNOME as a desktop environment. And if you're using GNOME, you need the app indicator and case status notifier item extension. After I install that, I will go back to installing Docker desktop on Fedora and I'll follow the guide to set up Docker's package repository for Fedora. So this guide is quite straightforward. You just install some dependencies, add the repository, and then just run DNF install on a couple of items, which include the Docker engine, the Docker CLI, the Docker Compose plugin, etc. After that's complete, you can start Docker. It's a service, so you can use uh, systemd's systemctl utility, and we are ready to install Docker Desktop. You can download the RPM package from the website, and you can install that with DNF. Just type uh, uh, DNF install and the file name. If you're using another repository, you can also use apt to install packages like this. Just make sure the file is executable on Fedora. Uh, I have that by default. But on Debian, you might need to make the file executable first before installing it with apt. And that's it. Now I can start the Docker desktop uh, graphical user interface client. You can just skip the steps for logging in accounts and everything. And you can see if the engine is running in the bottom left or start it from there. And you have a tray icon from where you can quit it. If you build RESTful APIs with Node, you will probably need a database. And if you use a relational databases, SQL based like Postgres, MySQL, or whatever, Postgres being the most popular choice nowadays, you will need a, it's useful to have a database graphical user interface client to check out the tables, debug some things, how it looks. You can use the command line for that too. But the graphical client is useful and I, I install one always on my development environment for relational databases. If you use a NoSQL database like Mongo, there are alternatives like Compass, I think was the MongoDB one. But for relational databases, I like to install dBeaver. We can just install dBeaver from Flatpak and FlatHub. It's available there, the community edition. Uh, just search for it and you can install it quickly and it works out of the box. Now, if you do front end of applications, which you probably will, if you're a JavaScript developer and not just a back end JavaScript, no JS dev, you will have to deal with graphics, which are rasters and vectors, whether that's icons, images, whatever. Um, there are plenty of utilities on Linux. The two most popular desktop app choices that are open source are GIMP for raster graphics and, of course, Inkscape for vectors. These are open source, full featured, available in all distros. You can install them and use them. I don't use those, actually. I use web non-open source apps, uh, Photopea for raster graphics, and I use Figma for vectors, the user interface app. It has uh, vector functionality that's user friendly and powerful enough, I find, for icons, for logos, basic vector editing, and it's enough uh, for my use case. 
I use Photopea and Figma as opposed to GIMP and Inkscape because I find the user interface more intuitive, more modern, and they really are very fully featured web apps, uh, very modern web apps as opposed to their open source um, counterparts, which are very full featured, um, but kind of old school, and they really show their age nowadays. Uh, but the features do compensate for that. So I would recommend both routes, depending on your taste. If you want open source, real desktop apps that are fully featured, go with GIMP and Inkscape. But I'll show you how you can use Photopea and Figma as simple alternatives in your browser to just edit graphics. Because really, nowadays, you don't need to do heavy graphics editing as a developer. You just need to do small tweaks, small optimizations, and in fact, we'll talk about optimization after graphics editing, because I have some special utilities for that. You can just Google Photopea, uh, freely available, and now you can click the button to start using it. If you do not have a paid account, you will see ads on the right. If you find that annoying, you can always purchase it, or as I mentioned, just go with GIMP. Otherwise, it's fully featured. If you've used Photoshop back in the day or nowadays, it's, it will be very familiar to you. Figma, on the other hand, is what I recommend for vector graphics. Here you will need an account, but the free one is quite generous for single users, and you can just start using it. Now, for optimization, you need to optimize both raster and vector graphics if you load them on the web, in a web application, or whatever. It doesn't matter where you use it, even if you bundle it in an Electron app. You still want your graphics to be optimized as much as possible. And I use two command line utilities for that. TinyPNG uh, COI, the Node application, which uses TinyFi and its API for raster graphic optimization, and SVGO for SVG Optimizer, which is again an Node.js command line app. Let me show you how to set these up and use them to optimize raster and vector graphics. I set up for raster graphic optimization is to use Tinyfy, uh, accessible through tinyfy.com. There you can use uh, the web user interface to optimize an image, but I like to use the API, which uh, you can make an account and log in and get an API key like I do here. Now, to use the COI, create a file in your home folder called .tinypng. And in that file, the only thing you need to paste the only content should be your API key on line one. After that, we will install the tinypng command line interface Node.js package. Note, I installed these global node packages in my LTS node version. After we install that, it will use the API key from the tinypng file in your home folder. And you can just go to, for example, any folder. I go to downloads and use tinypng and then a glob pattern. It will optimize an image and tell you how much you've saved through the optimization. For vector graphics, I use another node package called SVGO for SVG Optimizer. Just install it as a global Node.js package. It does not need an API key. It works locally and just run it with a glob pattern again. And it has a similar experience. It just overrides the image and optimizes it. So this is my development environment on Linux, at least the cornerstones of my full stack JavaScript dev environment. I also have other tools and I develop in other languages and use other environments, but full stack JavaScript is what I do for most of my day nowadays. And this is the software that is sort of my core toolkit, uh, which I use to do most of my work. And I wanted to share it because it might be useful to you. You might find something interesting, like a tool, software, a piece of software, or just an interesting rationale be behind my... Um, my way of doing things, my package management strategy, or my uh, graphics uh, software, whatever it is. I hope you found something useful and um, something of value in this video. So if you enjoy the content, don't forget to subscribe to get notified when I release another video. Take care.